forward to opening the Word together once again uh, tonight. Uh, this morning, I mentioned that I work at Inner City Baptist up in uh, Allen Park, Michigan. I didn't really tell you what I did, or what I do, I suppose, in the present. I still do it. I uh, really have a couple different spheres that I kind of run in up there. One is with our, sort of our church planning efforts, and particularly the part that I'm the most invested in as we bring in nine guys, college-age guys every summer as interns that sort of get exposed to different church plants and needs in the area. And the idea is we, we get them on a track that they'll stick with us through seminary and then help us with church planting in the area long term. So that's one area. And just recently, I started working with the uh, children's ministries, really zero through 18 as well. That was January of this year. And as I think back through other opportunities God has given me to be involved in ministry, I, I traveled with Aaron Coffey. And um, with his evangelistic team, I was part of the, the teen ministry. And while I was in college at Maranatha, I worked with the teenagers in that youth group at that church as well. So it seems like these, these teenagers and college-age guys, these are the ones that God has just allowed me to, to work with and minister to over and over again. And, and one of the hot-button issues with teenagers is always, you know, what is God's will? You know, they've got big life decisions coming up, right? They've got to decide where they're going to go to college, and of course, that decision automatically carries with it implications about who they should marry, and then what job they're going to get, and so on and so forth. You know, their whole life, it almost feels like, is wrapped up in these next few years' worth of decisions. Um, And I think we all probably know that's not the case, because the decisions just keep coming, right? You know, decisions about jobs and new job opportunities and where to live and, 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 the, and, and financial decisions and housing and all of these decisions that just keep rolling at you really throughout your whole life, right? The decisions don't stop coming. And so the, the challenge in all this as believers is to figure out what is God's will? And I think often we, you know, we answer that question by maybe looking at some passages in the New Testament that will tell us, well, explicitly, this is what God's will for you is. Abstain from fornication, be in the church, be in the word. And if we take care of these things that God is putting in front of us, then he will you know, keep the big picture rolling forward as well. And I think that's fine. I think it's a great way to think about God's will. But I want to do something different tonight. I want to, instead of looking forward, I want to look backwards. I want to look at how God has worked out his will in the past particularly in the book of Ruth. And, and I think as we do that, we'll be able to draw some principles about how God worked his will out in Ruth's life and in Naomi's life and those involved and draw those principles out and apply them to our own life as we pursue the Lord's will. So what does God's will look like? That's what we're going to start with tonight. And as we think about the book of Ruth, it's a well-known story. It's one that you could probably at least give me the big picture, the outline, and, and describe the events of Ruth so I, I think it's an engaging story. I think it's a, it's a great, uh, it's just a fun story to, to read through and think about. But um, it doesn't start just, you know, with, with sunshine and roses, does it? And you start thinking about at the beginning of the book of Ruth, what happens? I mean, I'll put the text here at the beginning of the, of the book of Ruth, verses 1 through 5 here. We've got a few things that come up, right? So first of all, we, there's a famine that shows up in Ruth, right? And in this famine... It basically causes Naomi and her husband Elimelech, her two sons, Malon and Kilion, it causes them to leave Bethlehem, their hometown, and go find somewhere where there's food. They go to the land of Moab, which, you know, you, if you know anything about Moab, that's a sketchy decision that's right here in the first few verses of the book of Ruth. These are kind of Israel's public enemy number one, and they leave Israel and they go to Moab. So they start off kind of with this sketchy decision, and before too long, bad things start to happen, Right? I mean, so the first thing we see that's a major issue is that the husband of Naomi died. This is Elimelech. So now Naomi's a widow. She's there with her two sons. They've married two Moabite women. And then, of course, what happens to them? Malon and Kilion die as well. So right here at the very beginning of the book of Ruth, in these first five verses, we have sort of the conflict of the story laid out for us, right? Here's the problem. We now have three ladies that are all widows, Uh, living alone in the land of Moab, two Moabite ladies and then one Israelite lady. And just to help us understand what this would have meant for them, I mean, let's spell this out a little bit in that culture, what it would have meant uh, that these, these men had died. First of all, Naomi has no property at all there in Moab. This is an agricultural society. How are you going to grow food? She has no property. 
Well, it's worse. She, she can't get a job there. She can't get a job there as an Israelite older widow. It's not happening. So there's no way to really produce any income. Uh, she has no family there in Moab other than her daughters-in-law. And back in Israel, you know, she really doesn't have a legal right to her husband's land anymore because the land was passed down through the men in the family. So now all the men are dead, so now she really doesn't even have legal right to Elimelech's land if she goes home. And really, legally, if there were no men in a family, that family ceased to exist. So when you look at it from that perspective, I mean, the grief would have been one thing to lose your husband and both of your sons in the span of about 10 years. But then just the logistics of it. What is she supposed to do? How is she supposed to continue to make a living? How is she supposed to, you know, just have a place to live, food to eat? These are the problems that are facing Naomi in the beginning of the book of Ruth. But I want you to think ahead with me. We're actually going to try to cover all four chapters this evening. And so let's think ahead all the way to the end of the book of Ruth. Okay, what, what are the results? What happens at the end of the book of Ruth? What's sort of the resolution of this storyline? Well, what happens is... Ruth goes back to Israel with with Naomi. She meets this guy, Boaz, and they have a child, and then that child has a child, and that child has a child, which is David. And if we fast forward a few more generations, we have Jesus, the Messiah. This is a a direct link in the chain that, that led to the fulfillment of God's promise to send a Messiah to save his people from their sin. The events of the book of Ruth They mattered immensely to the people in that story, and they matter immensely to everyone. Because this is what brought about the birth of the Messiah, Jesus, in Bethlehem hundreds of years later. So I think it's safe to say this. Whatever happens between these first five verses and the end of the book, would you agree with me? God is working his will out in these circumstances. Is that a fair statement? I mean, he is, right? This directly leads to the coming of the Messiah. So our our task tonight is to dig into this. What did it look like as God worked out his will in this narrative? What did it look like? How did he do it? So let's let's look at at chapter 1. I'm going to put all the verses we'll be dealing with on the screen up here as we go. You can follow along in your own Bible if you'd like as well. But basically what happens here is we have Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each one of you to her mother's house. Here's the point. Basically, in in that society... You know, you've ever heard of a dowry? That's the idea that, you know, if a, if a man wanted to marry uh, a girl, he had to go to that girl's father and pay the dowry. I'm blessed tonight to have my father-in-law with me. So in that circumstance, I would have had to go back here to, to Mr. Wright and say, okay, I'm interested in marrying Bethany, so what's the charge? He'd say, well, it's going to be, you know, 24 goats or something like that, and I would have paid up the goats, and then I, could have, I would have the right to marry Bethany. And that kind of functioned as a, as a type of life insurance policy. Okay, the idea was, if anything ever happened to me, Bethany could go back to her dad, and he's got those 24 goats that he can use to, to care for her when she goes back. So what Naomi's suggesting here is perfectly normal. Go back to your mother's house. You'll be taken care of there. And uh, she's, just, she's, she's telling the girls to do what would have been totally normal in that situation. And then she says this, I want you each to find rest in the house of of your husband. Now, obviously, their husbands were dead. So what she's saying here is, there's still a chance if you go back home that you'll be able to remarry, that you'll be able to have another husband and go on with your life in a normal way. So leave me, I'm an old woman, I'm a foreigner from Israel, go back home, You'll, you'll be better cared for and have a better chance if you do that. Of course, we know what happens, right? Um, But the girls don't want to do that. The girls love Naomi, and so they say, we will return with you to your people. They loved her so much, they were ready to go back to Israel, which is a big commitment. They're Gentile Moabite women. Remember, they're public enemy number one, and they're willing to go back with, with Naomi to Israel. But Naomi doubles down on what she said. She says, do I have sons in my womb? In other words, if you come back with me, even if I were to get married again, even if I were to bear children again, even if they were to be sons, you know, would you wait? You know, this is unrealistic. There's no future for you. There's no way this is going to work out for you if you go home with me. And so the result of all this is that it says Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. That's basically, see you later. She decides to go home. But Ruth says this. She says, I'm going back with you. Your people shall be my people 
and your God, my God. That's a statement where she says, the God of Moab was Chemosh. I've turned my back on him. I'll make your God, my God, the God Jehovah of Israel. And so Ruth is, has the die is cast. She's going home with Naomi, for better or for worse. She's taking the road less traveled. She's taking the high road, and she's going with um, with Naomi back to Israel. And as they come into town, back in Bethlehem, the, Naomi's hometown, look what happens. The women said, is this Naomi? I don't know, think about that with me. When she left, who did she leave with? She's got Elimelech, her husband. She's got Malon and Kilion, her two boys, and she's coming back, and none of those men are there. Instead, there's this Gentile woman tagging along with her. And so there's sort of a surprise. You can almost Picture the, you know, the rumor mill and the whispering going along through this little town. Hey, Naomi's back and something's up. Is this really Naomi? And Naomi apparently hears of all this and she says this, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Of course, I think if, we've, if we're familiar with our Old Testaments, we've probably seen that word used in another context. The bitter water as the children of Israel were, were coming across the, the wilderness and on their way to the promised land. The bitter water called Mara, the word means bitter. And so Naomi literally says here, call me bitter. Why? For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Went away full. I've come back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, seeing that the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi is, uh, at this point, I think she's, she's, she's showing us a little bit about what's going on in her mind and a little bit about what's going on in her heart. Um, at least her attitude toward God at this point, she says, call me bitter because God has dealt bitterly with me. His hand has gone out against me. He has brought calamity on me. So at the very least, we can say this. Naomi is ready to lay the blame for all of these circumstances squarely at whose feet? Right at God's feet. This is God's doing. He has brought calamity on me, and I am bitter as a result. So, so it seems like she's bitter, blaming God for her problems. She's kind of fatalistic. It's just this is the way it is. There's no way around it. It's not necessarily a very good look for Naomi here in chapter 1. Um, so let's zoom out here of the story just a little bit. And let's talk about some results, some of the things that have, have happened as a result of these events in chapter 1. First of all, Naomi has returned to Bethlehem. She's come back to her hometown. Second, Ruth has come with her. And at this point, really nobody's got any plans. They're just they're back in town, and we'll see what happens. But as we think about what God is doing... In, in this book as a whole, remember we're going from these, these problems that Naomi and her family are experiencing to the next link in the chain to the Messiah. Have we moved any closer toward God's ultimate purpose here in chapter 1? I, I think it's safe to say that we have, right? I mean, if Ruth stays in Moab, she never meets Boaz, right? So God is using these circumstances to work his will out here. So let me suggest a, a principle from chapter 1 for you. Here's the principle from chapter 1. Do you know God can use people who aren't committed to him? And that might be just a bit jarring when you first hear it, but look at it and think about it from the text. Would you say that Naomi is committed to God at this point? I mean, I think this, maybe the nicest way we can put it is to say that she's not committed to him. She described herself as bitter and said it's God's fault. So Naomi seems to be um, perhaps even at some level setting herself up in opposition toward God. So I think maybe the nicest way we could put it is to say that she is not committed to him. Yet, whose idea was it to go back to Bethlehem? It was Naomi's idea. And God used her even through her lack of commitment to bring Ruth back home with her to Bethlehem where she would meet Boaz. And so I think as we, as we look at our own life and we answer this question, do you have any people in your life who aren't committed to God? I mean, it's a, it's a resounding yes, isn't it? Think about different people. I mean, I, uh, I mentioned at uh, Maranatha, one of the things that I did was I, I worked with student leaders and sort of helped them as they ran different student-led organizations. And we had a guy who was a president of a student-led organization that initially, this guy, you thought, you would have thought he was all over it. He was so excited. Go. But then when the, the time came, that was in the spring semester, when the time came for his leadership sort of uh, cycle that started that fall, uh, he, he had lost all of his commitment. You know, he was gone for the most 
two most important events, right? At the beginning of the school year, he was actually visiting his girlfriend in Michigan. So it seemed like there was competing commitments going on there. But he sort of lost commitment. I mean, do we know people that, that they just really don't have commitment to God? You know, maybe at one point they, they talk a big game. They act like they're all in, and then a few weeks later, you're like, well, where'd they go? Or, or a few years later, they just, they just lack commitment. And it can be discouraging. It can be a thing like, man, I was counting on them, and they were going to lead this ministry, or they were such a key influence on my kids, and they, they lose commitment. Well, wait, 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 hold up. God can use people like that. And there's evidence right here in the book of Ruth. He used Naomi even when she was not committed to him. That's what we have here in chapter 1. Let's move into chapter 2. What happens here? So they're back in town. They're trying to figure out what to do. And, and Ruth has an idea. I'm going to go basically try to, to find some food so we can survive. I'm going to go to glean among the ears of grain in the field. I'm just going to gather the scraps that I can because at least maybe we can pull enough together for dinner tonight. She's fighting for survival. And then look what it says here. I love this part of the book of Ruth. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. You know, when I, I first memorized this section in the King James, and I kind of, the poetic language sticks with you there. It says, her hap was to light upon the part of the field belonging to Boaz. That's what it says in the King James. And, and the point of all this is, is she didn't really mean to wind up there. She was just going to any field she could to find some grain. And she just happened, from her perspective, to wind up in Boaz's field. Of course, we know the big picture. This was all part of God's plan for her to wind up in Boaz's field. And let me explain to you a little bit about what she was trying to do. So if we say this was Boaz's field here, this, this little square, the way it was set up back then, we've already talked about life insurance, now let's talk about welfare, okay? This was ancient Israelite welfare. The way they would do it, they would cut off the corners of the field, kind of like this. I don't know if that's proportionate, but the idea is the corners of the field were not supposed to be harvested by the guy who owned the field. They were left unharvested so that the poor could come and, and kind of pick their own grain and make a living. So that's what Ruth is doing. She's just taking advantage of sort of the standing system that was in place to help the poor, the welfare system, so to speak. So she comes and she's, she's working in the corners of the field like this, and as she's doing this, Boaz sort of, sort of takes a special interest in her. Look at what he says. He says, hey, Ruth, don't, don't go glean in another field. So she sort of wound up in Boaz's field by accident, right? And he's making sure she didn't wander off to another one. Hey, you stay right here in this field. And I want you to stay close to, to my young women. These would have been Boaz's servants, the ladies that were working in the field for him. Question for you, do you think they're working in the corners? Now she's getting an invitation to kind of come into the main part of the field here. She's got upward mobility. She's a promising young professional here moving up in the working class. Boaz is moving her along. Then it says, he says, I've charged the young men not to touch you. And to really get the full force of that, we've got to think about what would a, a young widow, Gentile widow, from you know, Moab with no men in her life. Is it possible that she could have been taken advantage of? Well, certainly by the farmhands around the fields. Boaz says, that won't happen here. I've charged the young men not to touch you. And by the way, when you get thirsty and you get hungry, you know, go, go, go drink what the young men have drawn. You're going to have all that, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to work in the main part of the field. I'm guaranteeing you my protection. You've got water here. Stick around in my field. And he continues to, to do this with Ruth. He says, when you get hungry, eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine that I've got here. He's continuing to favor her. And then he goes up to his men and he says, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, hey, let her go even among the sheaves. Go out in that main part of the field. She's fine. She's got security clearance. She's allowed to go there. And... Uh, what I want you to do is pull out some of the, the grain from the bundles and just drop it there for her. All right, so you've got a picture of this, the way they harvested this, you know, those big old knives that they would have, and you'd grab the stalks of grain, and you'd whack those things and chop them off. This is the situation that Ruth would have been in, and I don't know if she had the right equipment. It would have been difficult for her at any rate. And Boaz is saying, hey, just drop some pre-cut grain along the way for her so that she's got what she needs. So Boaz is, is really favoring Ruth here at this point. We might overplay it and like start reading in some romanticism going on in here. I don't know if it's actually there yet or not. But it, at any rate, Boaz respects what she's doing for Naomi. 
And he wants to take, out, take care of her as she tries to care for Naomi. So here's what she does. She gleans in the field until evening, and she beat out what she had gleaned, and she comes out with an ephah of barley, which if you were in men's Sunday school this morning, you know exactly what that is, right? An ephah of barley. It's a bushel basket. It's a, it's, what was it, a five-gallon or something like that containers that we said this morning. At the end of the day, it worked out to about a week's worth of food. So this is a, a pretty sweet deal. She goes out and she works for one day, and she comes back with a week's worth of food. It'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? You go to work on Monday, you're good for the week. You, you, don't, you can go home, you don't need to come back again, but I don't think that's what Ruth was doing. She would come back day after day, and she was building up grain for the future. I mean, she's actually got like a sustainable process now. If she comes back to Boaz's field day after day, pretty soon they'll be set for a good while. So, as, we, as again, we zoom back out and we look at the results of chapter 2, all right, first thing is that this immediate problem is solved. All right, Naomi and Ruth have a plan that'll work. If she goes back to Boaz's field over and over again, she'll be able to support um, herself and her mother-in-law. And, and I think we can at least say this, Ruth and Boaz have developed sort of a, a mutual respect for each other. Clearly, Boaz has some respect for Ruth, and I guess I'm inferring that Ruth probably had some respect for Boaz after all of this. There's a partnership of some kind forming here where they're working together, and, it's, and both sides are happy, right? So there's some level of a mutual respect going on here. Okay, so from chapter 2, let me suggest another, another timeless principle for you. Here it is. God can use people who have no idea what he's doing. All right, where do we see that from the text? Well, I mean, I think it's right there at the beginning of the chapter when Ruth just happened to wind up in Boaz's field. I, I don't think Ruth, you know, woke up that morning and said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to Boaz's field. He's going to set me up with all the goods that I need to survive. Before too long, we'll get married and just wait a few hundred years. Man, the Messiah is going to result from all this. That's not Ruth's process, thought process at all here, is it? Ruth's just going out and trying to survive. I mean, we, it is at some level a noble thing that she came back with Naomi and was willing to work hard to try to make a living for her and her mother-in-law. But at some level, it was a necessary thing, right? If she doesn't do this, she's going to starve. She's just trying to find a way to live. And God uses this because have we moved closer toward God working out his ultimate purpose in the book of Ruth. All right, we started. Ruth is over here in Moab, and Boaz is here in Bethlehem. Chapter 1 brought them to the same city. Chapter 2, what's happened? They're working in the same field. God is working out his plan, and he's doing it when Ruth had no idea what he was doing. So as we think about our lives, do we have people in our life who have no clue what God is doing? Perhaps you'd raise your own hand and say, I have no clue what God is doing in, in this circumstance in my life. I don't know what he's doing with, with my job. I don't know what he's doing in my family. I don't know what he's doing in our church. You've got a time of transition with Rodney coming on to be the pastor here. There's been a, what is God doing? What's the big, what's the end game here? What is God trying to do? You know, we, we often, more often than not, don't know what God is doing. But that's okay. <laughs> because God uses people who don't know what he's doing. And Ruth is evidence of that right here in chapter 2. Okay, so let's go on into chapter 3. And cha chapter 3 has some, has some fun stuff to talk about, okay? So here's what happens in the end of chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Ruth gets home. She's got this bushel basket of barley with her. And Naomi's a little bit surprised by this. You know, you know where did you get all this? She says, where, where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And, and Ruth says, well, it's this guy Boaz. I was working in his field. And then we have, you know, really about the only positive comment that Naomi makes in the book of Ruth. May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi said, this man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. All right, so obviously Naomi is excited not just about this ephah of barley. She's excited about who owns the field. All right, Boaz, this guy is a close relative of ours. He's, he's one of our redeemers, and perhaps you know what, he, what she's talking about here, but just in case you don't, well, we're going to need to discuss this a little bit. But the bottom line is Naomi sees this glimmer of hope. There's a chance that they're going to have a regular life moving forward, and it's because of, of Boaz. So we've got to talk about this whole deal, this, this 
idea of a redeemer. It's the concept of a, a kinsman redeemer, or it's called leveret marriage at some places in the Old Testament. And here's basically what it was, all right? So you've got, you've got two guys, we'll call them blue and green here. They're brothers, and they're just they're, they're single men living their life, and along comes pink, and blue, he, he takes a liking to pink. Blue falls in love with pink, and lo and behold, they get married, all right? So this is totally normal. This would happen in our, our culture as well up to this point. But here's what happened in Israel. Well, let's say tragedy strikes and blue dies, all right? Blue is out of the picture. At this point, pink's a widow. She has no husband. She has no children. And that's a big deal in their society because the land was supposed to be passed down through the family line. So if you don't have a male descendant, what happens to the land? Well, you know, it gets really complicated at this point. So they had a way to fix this. They wanted land to stay in the tribes they were allotted to. So the way they fixed this is green would stand in the gap. He would stand in the gap, and he and pink would have a child together. Now notice this. When the child is born, the child is blue. Right? It counts as blue's child, not green's. You follow me? That's what's going on here. And that, that's the way they had this thing set up. The idea that the terminology in the Old Testament is that he would raise up seed for his dead brother so that the land could continue to be passed down through the family line. That's what's going on here. And Naomi sees Boaz and goes, hey, he's a redeemer. He's related to us. Now, clearly, it's not, it's not Ruth's brother-in-law. That was the Old Testament command. The brother-in-law was supposed to do this. There were no brothers-in-law left. So what Naomi is seeing here is a chance. It's like, this isn't the letter of the law. This isn't exactly the way it works, but Boaz is related at some level to Elimelech, and maybe he can fulfill the role of the Redeemer. That's what Naomi wants. So Naomi puts together a plan. Let's talk about her plan here for just a second. She says, isn't Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? So he's, he's winnowing barley. They're threshing the barley at the barley floor tonight. And uh, so what you need to do, Ruth, she says, wash, therefore, and anoint yourself. Put on your cloak. Um, it's been translated by some as your wedding garment. Go down to this threshing floor, um, but don't, don't let him know you're there. I'll anoint yourself. I missed that one. But don't make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking, all right? Wait till he's had plenty to eat, plenty to drink. Hopefully she's not talking about alcohol consumption, but at any rate, she wants this guy in a good mood. And when he lies down, I want you to observe the place where he lies, and then just go uncover his feet and lie down, and he'll tell you what to do. And as we hear this plan from Naomi, and I think I've probably shaded it toward my interpretation a little bit as I've, as I've described it here. But, I mean, it just doesn't seem like a smart plan, does it? I mean, at the very least, it's a foolish plan. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong in Naomi's plan. Even if she doesn't have any ill intentions about this, it's at least a foolish plan. I would say at worst, she's saying, hey, Ruth, go, go seduce Boaz here. This is Naomi's plan because what do they need? They need, well, they need seed raised up to the dead brother. And so Naomi has a plan to make this happen. So what, what happens next? Well, Ruth, Ruth goes on and she follows the plan that Naomi had laid out. She goes up to the threshing floor. She uncovers his feet. And when he gets there, the cool thing is, is Ruth follows this plan with integrity and Boaz responds with integrity. Nothing nefarious goes down that night, and, and Boaz says, Hey, my daughter, don't fear. I'll do for you all that you ask. Everybody knows you're a worthy woman. It's true that I'm a redeemer, but there's actually somebody who's more closely related than I am. So hold up, and I'm, you just wait here tonight in the morning. You know, we're going to get this taken care of. As the Lord lives, I'll redeem you. If he won't, wait until morning. So Ruth follows the plan with integrity. Boaz responds with integrity, and and Boaz is on a mission to, to marry Ruth or do what he needs to uh, to make sure he can follow through with this, this kinsman redeemer concept the next day. All right, so let's talk about the results. What have we come away with in chapters 2 and 3? All right, so, well, number one, Boaz is on this mission to marry Ruth, and he's going to do it in a thoroughly legal and honorable way. We'll talk about that here in just a second. So as we're tracing, again, God's plan— you know, we've moved from Moab to Bethlehem to the same field, and now Boaz is saying, I want to do this. We're going to do this the right way. I mean, God's plan is being worked out here once again, right in front of us in Ruth chapter 3. And who is he using to do this? I mean, whose idea was this whole thing? It's Naomi's idea, right? And like we've said, 
You know, here's our timeless principle. God can use foolish people to carry out his plans. At best, I think we could say Naomi was foolish here. Could have been a lot worse. And God used her to carry out his plans. Now, I mean, are there any foolish people in your life? Surely there are, right? Surely you've had people that have made foolish decisions and you go, wow, you're letting your life spin out of control. What are you doing? I remember you know, a family member of mine, she had had a child with a man before she was married. She married another man. They had three more children. Then she divorced the first one to go back to the second one. I just remember the havoc that was causing in our family as all this was going on. And it doesn't seem like it takes all that much effort to realize this is a foolish arrangement. You know, why are you doing this? And, and, and the, the, the encouragement here in this passage is God can even use foolish people as he works out his plan. He's proved it in Ruth chapter 3, once again with Naomi. All right, so let's, let's go to the, the final act here. What happens in chapter 4? All right, so Boaz... He goes up to the gate, it says, and sat down there. This is a pretty significant thing. He goes to the gate. That's kind of like City Hall. That's where all the official business is conducted. And then he sees this guy that's the closer relative. He says, hey, turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And the guy comes and sits down. Then it says he grabbed 10 elders of the city. So now he's got himself. He's got the other party involved. They're at the City Hall, the gate there. And they've got the elders. They've got everything that they need to do legal business. Boaz is set to, set to go to work here. And the way he goes to work is, is pretty cool. I think it shows a lot about the wisdom and the character of Boaz. Look at what it says. He says, hey, we got this to deal with. There's this land that Elimelech had. Remember, Elimelech is Naomi's dead husband. So we got this land we got to deal with. It's got to go to somebody. There's no men in this family. So, you know, you're going to take it. You know, you're, you're a, the closer relative, or do I need to take it? Who's going to buy this land? Well, look what the guy says initially. He says, I thought I'd tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here. And if you won't, let me know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. And look what the man says. He says, I'll redeem it. This is a, no, this is a no-brainer in a business deal. And we're talking about an agricultural society. Property is everything. So this guy says, hey, there's land up for, for grabs. This didn't happen often. Land stayed in the family. But he's got an opportunity to increase the, the social standing of his family by, by acquiring this land from Naomi. So it says, I'll do it. I'll take this land. So Boaz is following the legal process to the letter. But then look what Boaz says here. He says, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, oh, there's a catch. You also acquire Ruth the Moabite, which I think that's interesting because nobody liked Moabites, so he's kind of just throwing that in there. Ruth the Moabite, she's the widow, and you've got to perpetuate the name of the dead. That's that whole practice I was just talking about, the blue-green-pink thing. You've got to perpetuate the name of the dead for his inheritance. And look what the guy, he changes his tune really quickly. The Redeemer said, I can't redeem it for myself. Here's his rationale. Lest I impair my own inheritance. So look here, here's what he's thinking. He's like, all right, so if I spend all this money and buy the field from Naomi, and then Ruth comes along, and I marry Ruth, and we have a child, what's going to happen? All that land is going back to Elimelech's family, and I don't get to keep it. So it's like a double whammy. I'm paying for the land, and I'm giving it back to their family. That would, that would mess up my inheritance. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. But I think it's awesome what Boaz has done here, because remember, this guy is not Ruth's brother-in-law. There's no explicit statement in the law that he has to do this. That's why he can pass up on it and say, I don't want to do it. And, and he could have just taken the land and left Ruth hung out to dry. But look what Boaz has done. He's put him in front of 10 of the most important people in the city. And he's basically said, hey, if you want the land, go for it. But you better take care of Ruth too. Or are you going to be a jerk in front of all the most important people in the city? Boaz is following the legal process to the letter, but he's navigating it with skill, with character, because then Boaz goes ahead and he takes the the right for Ruth himself. Boaz does this, but let me ask you this. What's going to happen to Boaz's inheritance? The same thing, right? He's going to spend all this money, then he's going to give the land right back to Elimelech's family. Boaz isn't in this because he wants to make money on the deal. He's not in this for his family to climb the social ladder. 
He's in this to take care of Ruth. That's what he's after here. He's being selfless in the way that he's approaching this. He's the man. Boaz is like, in all the weird stuff that's gone on in this book, Boaz just comes in and it's like, this guy is the man. He's doing everything the right way. He's doing it in an honorable way. He's doing it in a legal way. He's doing it in a loving way. Boaz is the man. And of course, from the end of all this, what do we see? Boaz takes Ruth. She became his wife. And, and uh, there's a son that's born. And what did we just already say at the beginning? They named this son Obed, who's the father of Jesse, who's the father of David. That's the result of this whole thing. Man, what a story, right? I mean, what are the results of chapter 4? Well, Ruth and Boaz get married, and Obed, Obed is born. That's David's grandfather. A happy ending, right? What a story. Let's draw our principle from chapter 4. Here it is. God can use wise and respected people like Boaz. Right? He's worked his plan out, and he's done it in all of these various ways. I mean, Hopefully, in your life, there's some wise and respected people. This is kind of the low-hanging fruit, right? God uses wise and respected people. We don't really have to establish that. We already knew that one coming in. But as we, as we look at this, I mean, what about ourselves? As we think about the, the will of God as it relates to ourselves, and we think about our four principles from tonight, are you always committed to God? The question is not, would you like to be? The question is, are you? And if we're honest with ourselves, we all know that we fall and we sin and we, and we lack commitment to God and his, and his word at points. All right, how about this one? Do you, do you always know what God is doing? Well, absolutely not. I think it was Piper that said something like, uh, you know, at any one point in your life, God is doing 10,000 things and you might be aware of 10 of them, right? We just, we don't understand what God is doing in our lives. He's doing things that are just above our pay grade. Man, are, are we ever foolish? Are there times that we do something, we look back and we just kind of almost like get that turn in your stomach. You're like, that was really dumb. I shouldn't have done that one. Have you ever, ever lived with regrets about a foolish decision that you've made? Or, or here, maybe every now and then, you know, I'm from Alabama originally and my dad would say it like this. He's like, every now and then a, a blind hog finds an acorn, right? You know, so and maybe every now and then you do something that's wise and respectable, okay? All right. These four things are our examples of the types of people that God used in the book of Ruth. All right, let's draw one big principle from all of this. Let's tie them all together. One big timeless principle from the book of Ruth. God's will is often uncertain. Is that fair? I mean, we've, we've all experienced that. But God will accomplish his plans through us or in spite of us. Now, the first part of that I think we're pretty comfortable with, right? God accomplishes his plans through his people. All right, that, that I think we're pretty comfortable with. But what about that second part? That God accomplishes his plans in spite of us. I mean, as we think about the book of Ruth, I mean, he clearly worked through Boaz. And I would say he worked in spite of Naomi. She's, she's bitter. God's hand is against me. You know, let's, let's come up with this plan to make sure everything works out the way we want it to between Ruth and Boaz. God worked in spite of her. I don't think we are, you know, on thin ice here either when we say God can work in spite of people. You think of other examples in Scripture where God worked in spite of someone. I mean, Jonah? He wasn't exactly the, the bastion of commitment, was he? Or wisdom. God worked in spite of him. And Saul, God worked in spite of him. Uh, I think of Joseph's brothers. You know, they meant it for evil. They didn't have good intentions, but God meant it for good, right? Judas, God used Judas in spite of his, of his wrong intentions and in what he did. So when we say that God can work you know, he will accomplish his plans, whether it's through us or in spite of us. I think we're on very, very strong ground from the witness of Scripture when we make this statement, right? We've looked at it in depth in the book of Ruth tonight. We could see it all over the place in Scripture if we wanted to. So my question for you is this. I mean, what are we supposed to conclude from this? This is clear from the text. This is clear from the passage. But what does it mean? Does it mean just go do whatever you want and God will work it out in the end? 
I mean, I suppose that is a, a, an application you can make from this, and I guess it would be accurate. It, no matter what you do, God will work out his plans in the end, right? That's true. Is that the proper application to make from this passage? I don't think so. God, God will work through us or in, spite of, or in spite of us, but the question is this then. If God doesn't need us, and that's essentially what I'm saying tonight, if God doesn't need us, to accomplish his plans, then why do we follow him? All right, let me tease that out just a second here, okay? We often kind of maybe, maybe even like without meaning to, sort of start to think that God needs us to accomplish his plans. I mean, think about that, that teenager that I was talking about, or, or really it was just kind of a generic group of this is what teenagers often think. Man, if I, if I choose the wrong college, then I'll, choose, I'll wind up marrying the wrong person. I'll wind up in the wrong job. My whole life will go off the tracks because I made this wrong decision at this point. Man, I, I, that's an awful lot of pressure for you to carry if that's the way you start thinking, right? I mean, it almost would have to make us picture God in heaven, almost wringing his hands going, man, I sure, hope, I sure hope Joe picks the right college because I've got all these plans for him, and if he chooses the wrong one, I can't do it. It's not going to work out. My plans, will be, my plans from all of eternity will be foiled by Joe. All right, That's, we can almost start thinking that way, right? Man, if I mess this up, it's not going to work. Man, I'm, I'm sharing the gospel with this person, and if I mess it up, they're not, they're, I mean, I, I've got this person's eternal destiny is in my hands. You know, we can start, we can really start putting ourselves at the center as like the key piece in God's plan. And folks, that's just not the way it is. God will accomplish his plans, whether it's through us or in spite of us. So if God doesn't need us to accomplish his plans... Why do we follow him? And if, he's gonna, if it's going to work out, he's going to make it happen, whether we make the right decision or the wrong decision. Why should we be concerned about making the right decision? There's probably a few right answers you could give to this. Okay, there's probably a few. Let me suggest one. We don't follow God because he needs us. We follow God because we need him. All right, do you realize what we've done here? Instead of, instead of, us being right at the center and everything riding on us, God's right at the center here. We, he doesn't need us. He's going to work out his plans. He's going to accomplish his purposes, but we need him. And what I mean by that is, what's the right way to live? What's the best way to live? Well, it's God's way. If you choose not to live God's way, then you're living foolishly. You're living a life that is going to have unnecessary hurt in it, unnecessary uh, failures in it, unnecessary uh, shortcomings. You're going you're gonna to experience things in your rebellion to God, whether, whether it's chastening as a child of his, whether it's, it's, you know, in the case of the lost, those that reject him for all of eternity. We need him. It's not that he needs us, but we need him. His way is the best way. Right, that's the point here. So when we're trying to find God's will, what this really does for us is it sort of, sort of takes the pressure off, right? I'm not having to sit here and go, man, if I make the wrong choice, it's over. I'm down the wrong track and I'm never going to be able to recover. The pressure's off there. It's not this like everything rides on me. It actually shifts our attitude toward what? Toward one of trust. I'm trusting God. He's going to accomplish this. I'm going to follow him to the best of my ability because it's the right way, because I need him, because it's the best way. And I'm going to trust him to work out the details. Man, what a, what a, what a more, that's a way to live that, that, that recognizes who God is as the sovereign ruler of the universe. It takes, takes ourselves off the throne and recognizes that he is there. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to do it his way. I'm going to trust him with the results. That's the way God wants us to live. That's the way we ought to view our relationship to him. Not one where he's kind of on the edge of his seat hoping we do the right thing, but on one where we trustingly follow him as his children. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these truths. We could go all over the place in Scripture and see how how circumstances and situations that seem like they are totally wrong were part of your plan and working out your will. 
Father, even as we look at the book of Ruth, in the first few verses, they go to Moab of all places. There's famine, there's death, there's, there's bitterness, there's, there's just a total lack of understanding of what's going on. There's foolishness and conniving. God, all of this stuff fit into the plan that you had for your people. Ultimately, the plan you had for the world as you brought Christ to save us from our sins. God, help us not to put ourselves on such a pedestal that we could think that, that the things that we do are going to make or break your plan. God, help us to submit to your plan, trustingly, with optimistic confidence about what you're doing, and to follow you because we know it's what's right, not because we we're kind of trying to manage things to make our world turn out the way we want it to. We can't press all the right buttons. We can't pull all the right levers. God, you've told us, you've revealed to us those things that are for our good. Help us to take the responsibility to follow you out of obedience and out of love for you, not out of, out of, out of manipulation and trying to hold everything together to make things work the way we want them to work. God, help us. This is a hard thing. We so easily sink back into our own pride and our own um, high estimations of ourselves and the ramifications of our decisions. Help us instead to trust you and to follow you in submissive obedience. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.